Director of the Pacific Basin Research Center at Soka University of America, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our first public event this fall. It's really wonderful to see many familiar faces as well as several virtual visitors here at our first gathering. Xiao uh, Xing Liu, our director, and I are really pleased to start our distinguished speaker series this evening with a presentation from a scholar with a remarkable academic record. Our guest is Professor Safal Ir, the Associate Professor of Diplomacy and World Affairs at Occidental College in Los Angeles. Professor Ir completed his graduate studies at Princeton and UC Berkeley. He has written extensively on political economy and international development. And among his many publications are monographs about the effects of foreign aid in Cambodia and the influence of a re-emerging China in Asian geopolitics. And most recently and most timely, he co-edited an issue from Cambridge University Press of their Politics and the Life Sciences Journal about the larger effects of COVID-19 on contemporary affairs. He is also a recipient of the Tobis Medal from UCI's Interdisciplinary Center for Scientific Study of Ethics and Morality. He serves on the boards of multiple journals in his field and is also an accomplished filmmaker. And Xiaoxing and I considered him an outstanding scholar in multiple areas of expertise, which have significance for future studies in and across the Pacific Basin and he's a presenter who can get us really engaged with some of the vital questions currently circulating within Southeast Asian politics and history. So it is our pleasure and our sincere honor to present to you our first distinguished speaker for this academic year, Professor Safal Ir. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, JP. I barely recognize myself. Um, I, I want to, I wanna first of all, say thank you to uh, uh, Director Xiaoxing Liu and and to you for working with me. I, I you know it's been I think almost a year it feels like from the time we first got in touch, talked about setting up a date, and then of course COVID hit, and then it was that it can't happen in person, so we have to set up a new date in the spring, and um, so it's it's just it's it's been such an adventure and a pleasure. Um, uh, working with you with, with um, Vice President Michael Weiner, who I guess uh, first you know, suggested the idea along with Professor Shane Barter. And so um, it's, it's wonderful to make this happen. Uh, and of course, I would have preferred being, you know, in Ale Sofiejo um, at SOCA at the Pacific Basin Research Center in person. Uh, but we'll have to make do with the fact that these virtual backgrounds that I could have chosen instead of uh, the one that I have uh, remind me and give me fond memories of my uh, visit a few years ago uh, when it was, I think, the occasion with the Western Conference um, on uh, uh, Asian uh, Association for Asian Studies. And so I was, I was just so glad to, to, to get that opportunity. Um, so thank you. Thank you for making it happen. Um, the talk that I'm giving today is titled um, What the Belt and Road Means for Democracy, the Case Study of Cambodia. And it's really a talk that's, uh, that could have been retitled um, uh, China and Southeast Asia from Threat to Charm Offensive to Threat Again. And, and it's, it's the idea that China, of course, has been this um, really powerful neighbor to Southeast Asia, uh, that Southeast Asia in, is within um, uh, China's sphere of influence in its backyard, and that while it provides um, you know, uh, a lot of infrastructure, it also presents itself as a possible threat to certain Asian, Southeast Asian countries because of the fact that it is so powerful and so large. Um, the question that I'm, that's, that's animating me in, in this research and, and in this talk is really the idea of does China, uh, through Chinese assistance, through the Belt and Road Initiative impact governance, uh, specifically democracy in Cambodia, and if so, how? And it's really this notion that Chinese assistance, and, and it's a work that I've done over the years on aid dependence and uh, how foreign assistance undermines democracy, which was written before China was, was a big player in Cambodia in terms of, of Chinese assistance. 
uh, it was more focused on official development assistance, so foreign aid, uh, classically termed, and how classic foreign aid from the OECD member countries was impacting Cambodia, how, for example, it might reduce the incentive to tax and therefore increase the likelihood that a country that is nominally democratic like Cambodia would, would be less accountable to its people because it wouldn't tax its people uh, receiving all that foreign aid and then, and then it wouldn't listen to the people who had elected uh, the, uh, the government in place. So, so, uh, so that was a danger, but of course, Chinese assistance now is the big player. And it, 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 I would argue is possibly playing the same kind of role in obviating uh, the need to be held accountable. Uh, so uh, sometimes I say, you know, uh, a broken clock is, is still right twice a day. Uh, somehow I happened to be right uh, earlier in 2012 when, when my book came out uh, from Columbia University Press, uh, Aid Dependence in Cambodia Have Foreign Assistance Undermines Democracy. And now, uh, again, it seems that uh, the, the role of Chinese assistance has, has played a, a role once again in, 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 in decreasing that, that, um, that accountability. Um, of course, correlation is not causation. And, and just because you see both happening at the same time, more assistance and uh, less uh, democracy or more authoritarianism uh, does not necessarily mean that one is causing the other, right? So Chinese assistance might not be the actual cause. And, and that's something that, that's been argued in, in workshops that I've delivered this talk to. Uh, Ran Xiao of uh, Fudan University has made that argument. It's, it's quite plausible. I mean, look, to find the determinants of something requires obviously a lot of data, triangulation, figuring out whether there's possibly other explanations. And of course, we have to avoid selecting on the dependent variable, uh, which means choosing only countries that exhibit a certain outcome, for example, countries that uh, you know, have uh, worsening democracy and saying, well, it's, it's gotta be because of Chinese assistance. Uh, it, it could also be that it's just like, you know, studying the lottery and only interviewing lottery winners. You can't just do that. You have to talk to lottery losers. Otherwise, your conclusion would be that playing the lottery means you're going to win the lottery. And lots of people obviously don't. So, so you have to talk to the ones who didn't end up winning that. Um, globally, democracy is suffering, and it's not just China or the BRI causing all of this behind every bush and around every corner. It's, it's authoritarian populism. It's Putin. It's, it's Trump. It's, it's so much more. And we, we know this from the uh, work uh, of, uh, uh, of, you know, the last decade, uh, decades I've seen sort of the, the arguments and they've, they've taken place there, the, the end of history, uh, democracy markets uh, essentially becoming the, the one thing that every country has to go towards. Well, what if it isn't? What if they don't win? And what if it's the spread instead of, 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 uh, of uh, essentially the opposite, right? So what if we're experiencing a setback in democracy? Um, Francis Fukuyama argued what we may be witnessing in his end of history was uh, the, not just the end of the Cold War, the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such, that is the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. He did argue that there could be these setbacks and we've seen of course now the cultural backlash uh, in uh, Trump, Brexit and, and the rise of authoritarianism, populism, which Norris and Engelhardt have, have said um, is, is happening. Uh, the state of democracy globally uh, has not been particularly bad in uh, you know, the last several decades, it's just more recently things have gotten bad. So if you look at the number of world citizens living under different political regimes, uh, the population living in democracy has increased certainly since the 1950s and, uh, and it's slightly declined since the 2000s. And now the question is where are things headed? The number of people living in autocracy um, obviously isn't always absorbing that because there are people who are living in what are known as anocracies, sort of in-betweens and so on. And so it's not clear and explainable in that sense. Uh, things don't look so great for freedom. If you look at um, uh, really the last few years, there's been a decline in the number of countries for which freedom 
has increased, right? So there are more countries where freedom has declined versus fewer countries where uh, freedom has improved. So uh, that's not good. And anecdotally, we know that there is, of course, uh, a lot of uh, uh, strain on democracy because of the rise of authoritarianism. Uh, here you have um, Erdogan with Putin, and a, a few years ago, a demonstration outside the Turkish embassy in Washington uh, led to nine people being injured. So uh, literally violence in the United States on the basis of something happening outside the United States. Um, you have, of course, uh, generals in Egypt, uh, even following uh, uh, the spring uh, revolution, um, the, uh, the Arab Spring, you have in the Philippines um, a pr president who has talked about murdering people when he was young and uh, nobody seems to know the truth necessarily, but it, it's, it's, it definitely feels as though uh, there's, there's not a good moment right now for, for democracy. And, and certainly even in, in Thailand here, the Thai uh, prime minister with, uh, with the uh, foreign minister of, uh, of China uh, shaking hands. So again, we could be, I could be selecting on the dependent variable. There are cases certainly like Taiwan um, where democracy seems to be thriving. Uh, uh, but even beyond that, there are already clouds. So, you know, for two years, Malaysia's uh, Mahathir was able to uh, boot out the, uh, the ruling party, the UNMO. Uh, he lost and now that ruling party came back to power. Uh, and so um, Malaysia is no longer the, 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 the case that, that everyone hoped would, would present as democracy uh, resurrected. But at its core, this is really a story that's more than about uh, democracy. It's, it's really about the golden rule. And um, what is the golden rule? It's not the one you know. It's that he who has the gold makes the rules. And Prime Minister Hun Sen of Cambodia has been very good at following that gold, uh, making sure that, um, that uh, the resources of China are available to his country, to himself, to his party. And um, he went for, that, that was a picture, by the way, I should, I should, I should elaborate. He was, he was giving a press conference in which he, he admonished the reporters for wearing masks. And he said they should not be wearing masks. And if anybody wore masks in his press conference, they'd be kicked out. Um, and so it was, it was a, a very awkward moment at the beginning of COVID-19. Um, and at that same beginning, he went to China to be one of the only really head of state to fly and pay sort of uh, homage to Xi Jinping. So he flies and shakes hands with Xi. And she tells him that a friend in need is a friend indeed. And so that is... Uh, the message, and even now it continues to be that message of, you know, I remember that you came to see me uh, when I was in trouble and when things were not looking great. Um, he's had other interesting uh, episodes in that, in the, in the month since, and one of them was the uh, docking of the uh, Westerdam cruise ship, which had been denied a port of entry um, to five ports at that point across different countries. And so he had allowed that cruise ship to come and dock in Cambodia and, and to let out its passengers. Uh, of course, it wasn't clear necessarily at that moment whether everyone aboard that ship was in fact COVID negative. Uh, later, Malaysia claimed that uh, a passenger uh, leaving that ship flying to Malaysia was in fact positive, but it was a moment of, of, of triumph in terms of flowers, roses being received, hugs and kisses, and a feeling of, of very much, you know, he had done the right thing for, for those people. And even President Trump tweeted a, a thank you uh, to, to him. But let's start really where the real money is. And uh, the real money is when your boss calls a meeting during a soon to be pandemic. And that's, that, that was certainly the case of the special ASEAN China foreign ministers meeting uh, that took place in Vientiane uh, in uh, February of 2020. Subsequent meetings have taken place virtually because finally they figured, you know, maybe going to meetings in person might not be the best idea during a period like this. Um, it's also been an opportunity, I should say, for the authorities, uh, not just in Cambodia, but elsewhere, but in particular here, I'll talk about Cambodia, to pass 
state of emergency laws that, that are on the basis of, you know, there's a pandemic, we need to take control over things, we need to have a legal framework for all of this. And so um, Cambodia passed the state of emergency law that really was a little bit beyond uh, any kind of pandemic. Um, it, it essentially allowed uh, that for everything that the authorities thought could cause severe chaos to national security and social order uh, to be essentially uh, stopped. And, and uh, on that basis, I think it's, it's clear that the state of emergency law is not really about COVID. It's, it's about being able to stop things later on. In all seriousness, there are economic considerations that are really, really um, huge. And you have, to, you have to think about it in terms of, you know, when, for example, you look at the withdrawal of the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, the TPP was to be this, uh, uh, this trade agreement with the United States uh, and, and Canada, Mexico, Peru, Chile, uh, Australia, various uh, Southeast Asian countries to essentially agree to labor standards, environmental standards, uh, and uh, in intellectual property standards that would uh, make it possible for those countries to elevate those standards while trading with each other. So a kind of deep uh, 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 free trade agreement that isn't the kind that China would participate in. It never said, TPP never said that China couldn't participate in it. It's just that it was well understood that China would not agree to participate in, an, in, an, in, the, in the TPP because of those standards. Um, RCEP, which is the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Program, I think, of, of China, the sort of the answer to this is more of a traditional free trade agreement that's about lowering tariffs, but not looking at labor, environmental, or uh, pro intellectual property standards. 60% uh, of, of U.S. trade is with the uh, Pacific region. Um, that is uh, obviously what drives a lot of this, these considerations. Asian maritime and regional security are vital to U.S. interests. And of course, there's a large Asian American population that goes, uh, that, that, that lives in the U.S., 6%. I mean, it's not super large, but it's, it's still 6%. But more importantly, they're the fastest growing ethnic group. Asians dominate the vast number of foreign uh, students in America. Now, of course, these days, they're probably studying from their respective countries uh, because of, of the pandemic, um, while remotely, obviously, logging in. Uh, just look at the geoeconomic context. You're seeing here a, uh, a map of Southeast Asia in which, you know, this is dated uh, a few years ago, but still $2.1 trillion, 1.7 million square miles, 618 million people. Uh, $3,500 per capita GDP, not obviously not a huge amount, but still enough, uh, one would argue, for a market to, uh, to exist. And of course, China itself, you know, uh, much larger in terms of economy, 10.028 trillion back in 2014, 3.7 million square miles, 1.3 billion people, so twice the per capita GDP. A lot of the um, uh, ethnic Chinese hold on Southeast Asian economies uh, is quite telling. Uh, you see here uh, the percentage, and it is, you know, in the Philippines, 62%, in Cambodia, 92%. Now, that doesn't mean they're, you know, Beijing ethnic Chinese. It, it, it could be that they were multi-generational ethnic Chinese living in these countries, but they basically control the commerce happening in uh, Laos, 99%. Uh, Vietnam, 41%. Um, so quite a large number. And it's really been China's game. If you think about the fact of uh, the military visits between China and Cambodia be, uh, from the year 2013 to 2017, there have been innumerable visits. So Chinese personnel uh, coming to Cambodia, various generals and admirals, uh, and Cambodian personnel going uh, to um, uh, to China, uh, and it's it's clearly a, a bit of a love affair, and there have been uh, a number of um, military exercises that have taken place, equipment that has been displayed, um, right around elections, by the way, which of course sends a message that um, you know China is there to support the uh, current regime in case of anything happening. Um, it's a long history, of course, of Chinese presence in Cambodia. Uh, the book Brothers in Arms talks about this 
during the Khmer Rouge period. Uh, there, there have been various waves of investment in the garment industry. Um, over time, it has shifted to energy, mining, agriculture, and real estate. And now, of course, there's hydroelectric power expansion and uh, development finance and soft loans. So it, it's, it's, it complements, I think, a lot of what's happening in Cambodia because it, it, there's, there's a need right now for infrastructure. There was a statistic somewhere at some point in which uh, something like 70% of Cambodia's roads and bridges were somehow Chinese finance, which seemed absurdly high, but the Minister of Transport was quoting that number and it, it was unbelievable to, to, to see that. And China, of course, has been going global with its uh, Belt and Road, it used to be called One Belt, One Road. So it's, it's, it's sort of, you know, the interesting thing with China is that uh, a lot of deals are announced, uh, maybe out of uh, four or five deals, one actually materializes. All the signing and the ceremony takes place. With Japan, the typical uh, experience has been instead, you know, if you're going to sign something, it's going to happen. It's not, it's not some uh, phantom deal that isn't happening. And for, for Belt and Road, it seems that there's a lot of this, uh, you know, lots of announcements and not necessarily follow through. Uh, but we've seen this uh, new Silk Road uh, where China is um, uh, trying to create, recreate uh, the Silk Road, but maritime wise. Um, you notice here, of course, that there's, um, there's Sri Lanka and there's uh, uh, an intention certainly to, to, uh, to uh, encircle in some ways uh, India, which if you think about it is really China's main competitor because um, with its population, India will uh, someday have a, a very, very large economy that, that should give China competition. Uh, we know about the port of Gordar in Pakistan, um, Hambantota port in Sri Lanka, uh, Kakong New Port. Uh, these are ports that uh, Chinese investments have uh, essentially been made and eventually uh, it is suspected are not of commercial value, but still somehow uh, the Chinese have decided that these are ports that they need. It happens that they, of course, encircle India, which is of concern, uh, I'm sure, to the Indians and to the Americans. Um, the sources of aid to Cambodia have varied over time, but you can see that China's officially, at least, if you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, defined as ODA, China has had an expansion and recently more of a, you know, it's not clear exactly who's dominating. I mean, some of this is double counted in that NGOs are getting aid. Well, they're, they're getting it from, from certain countries, obviously. So it's not entirely clear. Uh, and the overall international aid picture is, of course, one of China increasing its involvement generally. But what China gives isn't necessarily classified as official development assistance because it isn't always um, the, uh, the concessional uh, aid component. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, at a certain low interest rate and it doesn't have to have a certain time span. So it could be commercial in nature and uh, so categorized more as uh, what's known as OOF, uh, other official flows. Uh, now, some of you may have seen this uh, in the past, but I've got a couple of videos uh, of, uh, of China trying to explain the Belt and Road Initiative to I guess, lay audiences. And I'm going to play this. Hopefully, it's going to work. Um, so let's see. And let me know if there's no audio, because I want to make sure there's audio. I'll stop it here. Was the audio okay? Can somebody just confirm that there was audio? The 
audio is great. Okay, great. Um, so essentially, the the um, the concern is uh, well. First of all, it's nice. It's a nice earworm of a song. Uh, hopefully, you're not going to go to bed humming that tune. But uh, they also have, of course, uh, a uh, a uh, bedtime story version which has been uh, shared with the world, and that is the uh, the storytelling by uh, by the fa by a father to his daughter. Time for bed, sweetie. Okay, Papa. Now, Bob's going to be gone a few days since the and I'll miss you. Why? I'm going to attend a forum in Beijing on the Belt and Road Initiative. What's that? Okay. Once upon a time, several routes led from China through Central Asia to Europe. It was called Silk Road. People would put things on camels and cross the desert to trade with other people. Like country sharing? Yeah. And then later, ships traveled from China through Southeast Asia to Africa. And they'd bring things. So just to give you, just to give you that, and I think it was a, a reporter uh, who somehow ended up being <laughs> cast in this. Um, but it has been really a win, 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 win for China in terms of uh, how to use excess capital that it has to lend out for essentially uh, tendered projects that must be won by Chinese firms, which then go and, and build the infrastructure, but using, of course, Chinese workers. Uh, and that solves also a, a, a population problem, given the, uh, the gender uh, divisions in, in China and the sex election towards men. So there are too many men anyway. So it's, it's great if they find spouses in the new countries that they end up working in, um, then that might solve another problem, a more personal in nature. Um, and of course, if things go wrong, uh, there's a debt equity swap that can happen where uh, the loan that was used to build the infrastructure can be turned into equity, as happened in Sri Lanka, uh, with a 99-year lease on Hambantota port. So that that obviously is is a um, situation where the uh, the the resources, uh, the infrastructure becomes some kind of property of China at that point. But you know how far, what can they do with it, isn't. Uh, necessarily spelled out. So this was uh, July 29, 2017, Hambantota Toda uh, essentially being handed off and, and a, a check uh, of $292 million uh, lottery looking check uh, being given in exchange, I suppose, for uh, or to pay the Sri Lanka Port Authority. Now, uh, I know we saw, we saw Vice President Pence yesterday. I'm sorry to put him on tonight, uh, but uh, he wrote, he said in a speech, in fact, China uses so-called debt diplomacy to expand its influence. Today, that country is offering hundreds of billions of dollars in infrastructure loans to governments from Asia to Africa to Europe and even Latin America. Yet the terms of those loans are opaque at best and the benefits invariably flow overwhelmingly to Beijing. Just ask Sri Lanka, which took on massive debt to let Chinese state companies build a port of questionable commercial value, Two years ago, that country no longer could afford its payments, so Beijing pressured Sri Lanka to deliver the new port directly into Chinese hands. It may soon become a forward military base for China's growing blue water navy. And look, you know, whenever the argument is made that they're building, they're getting bases in Sri Lanka or they're getting a base in Cambodia, it, it, the retort seems to be, well, America has hundreds of bases around the world, so why should China not be allowed to have a couple of bases somewhere? Um, a valid point, certainly, but you know, obviously, when it's done with that diplomacy, that's the, that's the question: Do the countries actually know what they're getting into? And some of that can be also with airports, where in Sri Lanka, also here in this case, there's the world's emptiest airport. Of course, these days, all the airports of the world are pretty empty. Uh, but in in the case of this airport, a 10,000 square meter airport, it really was getting only a couple of uh, flights per week. Um, for a brand new airport of, of really questionable commercial value. Um, and it, it isn't just roads, bridges, empty airports and ports. There, there's, there's private investment in high rises, condos. Um, there's actually, in Cambodia alone, there's 193 casinos at the moment licensed. I don't know if they're all Chinese, but the, certainly the vast majority of them are Chinese. 
and uh, it's more than Vegas and, and Macau combined. Uh, and I don't know why one would need 150 or you know even 193 casinos. But uh, the uh, the city of Sihanoukville on the uh, edge uh, the, on the coast of Cambodia has got at the moment. Um, well, this is. Uh, a year ago, but 156 hotels, of which 150 are Chinese-owned, uh, 436 restaurants, of which 414 are Chinese-owned, 62 casinos, of which 48 are Chinese-owned, and 41 uh, karaoke clubs and 46 massage parlors. Uh, I am not sure we need that many karaoke clubs or massage parlors in one town, but that is uh, the uh, uh, <laughs> that it seems to be the supply. Um, there are also, of course, other places in Cambodia like Diamond Island where, uh, where um, uh, condos have been built, uh, which appear to be uh, unoccupied. Now, that is the, the, a problem that has been prevalent also in China where uh, construction is used to essentially store your wealth, right? You buy the property in order to essentially uh, convert your money into a real asset. And uh, so these ghost cities are, 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 are units, uh, as units uh, are snapped up and left empty, driving up real estate prices. Even Xi Jinping said, you know, uh, houses are built to be inhabited, not for speculation. And it was in February 2009 in Mexico when he spoke to some Chinese uh, businessmen at the uh, Chinese embassy there that he said there are a few foreigners with full bellies who have nothing better to do than try to point their fingers uh, at our country. China does not export revolution, hunger, poverty, nor does China cause you any headaches. Just what else do you want? And it's, you know, obviously it was a point that I think is relevant later when you see this idea of exporting revolution, because it's something that the uh, uh, Cambodian government has repeatedly used in trying to explain why it has to do things the way it does, because it's always this revolution, this this attempt at causing revolution in Cambodia. Uh, there's, of course, soft power uh, from uh, China and, and uh, everyone else involved in the game. Uh, this soft power is to influence uh, by persuasion rather than coercion. And the original definition did include investment and aid or formal diplomacy. It can be aimed at high or low uh, targets, but uh, you can think of it as Hollywood, you can think of it as as K-pop, BTS, uh, or you can think of it as uh, Chinese language schools. Here, the, uh, at the time, the largest uh, Chinese language school outside of China was at one point in Cambodia. And China, of course, has done a lot of, of building in Cambodia for the Cambodian government. So the Senate complex uh, with its own golf range was built in 1999 after that uh, uh, year's election in which more politicians needed a place to be parked. And so a Senate was created. And in 2009, this Council of Ministers building was, was built, um, which has a kind of pyramid looking thing in the middle there that was supposed to be the prime minister's office, but he didn't want to use it. Uh, he said it was bad feng shui. So he had another building built uh, right in front of it. And so it seems to have been uh, now, it seems to be now the peace palace that he uses. Of course, you know, when China builds a building like this with its workers, 24-7 construction, um, no one knows if there could be listening devices in the walls already baked in. Uh, it's, it's impossible at that point to, to really remove them. Um, there have also been reasons for Cambodia to be a friend to China in so far as um, when Uyghurs try to uh, got into Cambodia and tried to get asylum, uh, 21 of them, um, in 2009, they were basically stalled for several weeks. And then the day before Xi Jinping, at the time Vice President Xi Jinping, came to, to Cambodia to sign $1.2 billion worth of, of, uh, of deals, uh, they were flown to China and have never since been heard from again. And so there had to be Kind of an answer from the United States for that. It, it meant that uh, certain trucks that were going to be given to uh, Cambodia from the United States were not given. Uh, and the reaction from the government was, if the U.S. gives us the equipment, that is good. Uh, we're happy. And if they won't give it, give it to us, it is also good. So, you know, we don't really care. Um, uh, but it's not just China calling the shots. Uh, it's uh, Cambodia making threats beyond its borders. 
Um, and the prime minister has said that he only needs seven hours to find anyone on Facebook within Cambodia's borders to arrest them. So this poor gentleman here, San Rata, 29, was sent to pretrial detention uh, for, of all things, writing on Facebook that the, uh, uh, that, the, that the government was authoritarian. And so that apparently is the definition of authoritarian, to be arrested for saying the government is authoritarian. Um, he's also, the Prime Minister said that he would send people to beat up protesters um, in Australia. Uh, and so the ASEAN Australia Special Summit was, was kind of this uh, difficult situation in which uh, uh, Hun Sen said he wasn't going to show up because he didn't like, he didn't like what, what was happening. Um, but he ended up showing up and he, he, I, I don't think anyone got beat up, but it was, it was, it was an uncomfortable situation to say the least. Um, so really, democracy is in, is in global retreat in some ways, and, and you can see that freedom has shrunk in Southeast Asia. You've got the opposition dissolved, leaders jailed and exiled in Thailand uh, and Cambodia and elsewhere. Facebook posts lead to arrests. I've already mentioned the Philippines with Duterte, Thailand, multiple attempts at elections. Uh, and even within China, there's certainly uh, a recognition that things aren't what, where they should be. There's the always the Winnie the Pooh incident with uh, banning uh, comics and such for apparently resembling too much the president. And for Cambodia, you know, I would argue that at some level there's been a kind of um, conversion of Cambodia into this uh, province of China uh, or wholly owned subsidiary. Um, it, it's something that uh, Dan Coates, the uh, director of national intelligence at the time, uh, pointed out, you know, he, he, he was concerned that the Cambodian constitution would be violated because it doesn't allow foreign troops in Cambodia to be stationed there. And that um, somehow with the ruling party controlling everything, they would change the constitution. Um, there's also, of course, a concern that a military base would be uh, built in Cambodia under the guise of a resort. And there is, uh, there is some truth to that. The Union Development Group uh, of China is building this resort, this $3.4 billion resort. And it has built this uh, runway that is uh, the longest runway in Cambodia, longer than even any runway at Phnom Penh International Airport. And it's literally in the middle of the jungle. So it's a, it's a strange place to have a, a runway that large. Um, I've also, of course, argued that the Chinese see commercial ports as a foot in the door for their Navy. As long as you've got deep water, you can, get a, 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 a ship in there and a blue water Navy can use it. Um, now, there has been a response from the United States. It is to essentially use a global Magnitsky uh, human rights accountability uh, to sanction uh, Union Development Group, the, the corporate, the Chinese company that's doing this, it's associated with the, with the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. And so uh, Global Magnitsky allows that designation to basically blacklist the company and not allow it to do business with Americans, not use US dollars and so on. It's, it's, it's named after uh, uh, this gentleman who it was killed in Russia for, um, for you know, uncovering corruption. Uh, so the US Treasury Department has been busy in, in saying that, that this project uh, known as Dara Sakor is in violation uh, because of environmental degradation, but of course the under the the undercurrent is that China is doing something it shouldn't be doing in Cambodia. And there's also another activity happening now, as I as I'm say, and as I'm speaking, in Riem uh, Naval Base, where a U.S. built uh, facility uh, was was demolished essentially to make way for what appears to be a Chinese uh, uh, facility. Uh, so Prime Minister Hun Sen here with, with uh, President Xi uh, promoting uh, Xi's A Governance of China book, which uh, ha has been uh, circulating in Cambodia. So it's certainly a kind of belief in uh, maybe indoctrination, uh, another kind of book, uh, maybe a little red book in the past. And um, the, the minister has, uh, the Minister of, of Foreign Affairs for China here hugging the Cambodian minister, uh, Prime Minister, which of course isn't quite the hug that uh, Hun Sen gave to uh, to Prime Minister Prayut of, of of Thailand, but I think it's 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 quite telling that the the relationship has been so close, really. Um, so 
I'd say really in my last few minutes uh, of this presentation, Cambodian democracy has been gutted. I don't, I don't care if the argument is there was never democracy to begin with. Um, so nothing was destroyed. Of this, I am certain Cambodians are less free to speak today than they were a year ago, two years ago, a decade ago, maybe even two decades ago. Uh, and I know this is seen as revisionist history uh, uh, by the authorities because they have their version of history. But you, we, we all recognize that uh, you know, labor rights activist Chia Vichia, environmental activist Chip Wuti, political commentator Kem Lay were all killed under very, very assassination looking uh, 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 circumstances. And of course, the prime minister has, has, has said, you know, let us solve our problems ourselves. Meanwhile, his opponents like Sam Rang Si can't get home. He was stuck in Malaysia for a while, then Indonesia, returned to France. The co-head of the uh, opposition party has been jailed for a year under house arrest. Now kind of, you know, can't, in, can't engage in politics on trial now. Uh, the game has been one of, of divide and conquer, which is to put the, uh, to the opposition parties against each other. And what changed was that they combined forces and then it became very scary for the authorities because they were, they were now one party and quite strong. There have been others, um, Musaku uh, here, who, who haven't been able to re-enter politics or re-enter Cambodia for that matter. And the authorities are always publishing these you know, white uh, papers titled like To Tell the Truth, in which they're trying to re-narrate the story of Cambodia. Uh, but the truth is, of course, that they've expelled the National Democratic Institute, shuttered Radio Free Asia, um, uh, closed off the Cambodia Daily, the equivalent of really the New York Times of Cambodia, uh, sold off to their own friends, the Phnom Penh Post, and then, of course, took over the seats of the opposition party by dissolving the opposition party through a judicial rigged process. So the seats that were in blue here all became controlled by a royalist party that was essentially working with the ruling party. And so it effectively dissolved the opposition, um, the opposition's power. And then in the next election, they won all the seats, the, um, the ruling party. And so people like Kem Lay, who after speaking about um, you know, a global witness report uh, detailing corruption in Cambodia was assassinated. It was uh, one of the really shocking moments of contemporary Cambodian history where, you know, a million people turned out for his funeral, uh, tried very much to get to the location of his funeral and the authorities closed all the gas stations to prevent them from refueling, or rather they said to cause chaos or whatnot, but really quite, quite a sad thing to, to have seen. Um, the EU has responded uh, with uh, everything but arms suspension of 20% of Cambodia's exports, a billion euros. And of course, there have been these global Magnitsky human rights accountability um, uh, actions against Cambodian entities, Chinese entities, and so on. But the authorities have continued in, in their war path. So instead of seeing the light, they've arrested more activists, um, you know, young activists, which is really sad given that they're really the hope for Cambodia because of what they do, uh, trying to bring about change in the country. Um, in this 132 page white paper, uh, the argument is that the color revolution is what is being imposed on Cambodia by the West. That's what's being transmitted into Cambodia and that's what needs to be stopped, uh, the authorities uh, say. And it's, it's, really, it's really the narrative that Xi Jinping gave in 2009, exporting revolution, which is now being seen in Cambodian white papers about, you know, this is what we have to stop. We have to stop this, the, these color revolutions from changing, from regime change in their view. Um, the preamble to that report has a quote from the prime minister in which he says, real democracy in Cambodia has not been set back or fallen. Instead, it has been protected and strengthened in accordance with the principle of the rule of law for the great benefit of the people and nation. Only fake democracy has been abolished, uh, which I think turns on its head everything that we understand is happening in Cambodia. Suddenly it's fake democracy that's been abolished. It is now real democracy that's happening in Cambodia when in fact, of course, there is no opposition party effectively. And so that reminds me in my closing slide here of something that um, the prime minister once did at a 
uh, little soccer game, friendly soccer game to the cameraman, which seems to be an unfortunate side effect of the actions of a uh, regime that is very interested in, of course, controlling and stopping any opposition. So with that, I will end here and take questions. Uh, I think, uh, JP, you're going to help me uh, uh, collect some or moderate in some way? Uh, yeah. Um, if people have questions, we will ask, please, that you put them in the chat. And uh, both I and Kaio Yoshikawa, the co-host, uh, will help sort through them because there are so many people at the talk. All right. And I'm seeing so many friends on here. So nice to see everybody. Uh, I can start with a question that we, uh, the PBRC received earlier by email, if that's good. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, a question that China's BRI is both a curse and a blessing for Cambodia. As if that isn't already complicated enough, the West apparently misread Cambodia's situation and in doing so could dangerously and accidentally trigger a new Indochina war. What is your take on that assessment? Well, uh, when it comes to Cambodia, I don't know who would be the, I mean, like, it, I think the implication is that the, the war would be what between China and the United States or something. Uh, but but uh, if anything, Vietnam is really the country that's been asking the United States to, uh, to show, flex its muscle, because Vietnam historically has always wanted China to be sort of at arm's length from it. Uh, it it's ha has a long history of confrontation with China. And so um, even with its 41% ethnic Chinese controlling uh, uh, the economy, there's a, there's a sense that, um, that uh, certainly between the United States uh, saying, hey, China, you've got to stop doing what you're doing in Cambodia. You've got, you've got to stop doing these, these uh, projects that look like naval bases or, uh, or airfields that look like they're designed for, uh, for planes that don't seem to need to land in this area. Uh, that uh, somehow this would aggravate China. I don't know that China has, 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 has enough of a uh, buy-in to Cambodia to want to engage um, uh, the United States in any kind of uh, uh, kinetic uh, confrontation. If anything, I have a student in China now who's saying that uh, veterans are being called to, uh, to reactivate. And I thought, oh my God, is there something happening between uh, that China thinks will be happening with the, with the United States soon? And it was more to do with India. So uh, that's, that's another can of worms. Uh, and of course, it's what I've been saying in the presentation that India as a country is really the, the, uh, the future competitor, if not already seen as the competitor to China that China needs to kind of keep, keep under control. Oh, th uh, thank you. Th I, I just wanted to add a question there. Do you mean then that these uh, developments from China really are much more a reaction to the future growth of India than any long-range plan of engagement with the United States. Yeah, I, you know, of course, of course, the U.S. naval presence will continue. Um, uh, there's, a, there's certainly the view that it doesn't really matter what China does. The U.S. Navy will travel, uh, will uh, do uh, freedom of um, of, uh, of navigation exercises and movement uh, throughout uh, the South China Sea, the Straits of Malacca. It, there is no way that the U.S. is simply going, to, and, and, and really a lot of this is, has to do with if your Navy is there, who's going to stop them? And, and, and it has to be, you know, is it worth it for, for China to, to respond to that uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that, 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 that could trigger uh, violent confrontation? At, at this point, uh, you know, even talk of Taiwan being the basis for that or, 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 or Hong Kong being the reason. No, of course not. We've, we've seen Hong Kong basically uh, drop its uh, two systems, one country uh, way and nobody, I mean, okay, there's sanctions, but nobody's going to war about it at the moment, at least. So, so that's, that's, that's the reality. Thank you. A, uh, a question from Lisa McLeod, one of our faculty members. How much longer do you expect Hun Sen will be in power? I assume until the end of his life. 
is there any sign of a struggle for succession within the currently ruling party? So, you know, he's been in power 35 years, um, one of the longest serving prime ministers in the world, really, uh, certainly in, in Asia and Southeast Asia. And he's not even that old. I mean, you know, he's, he, it's kind of incredible because he started so young. So he's in his 60s. It, it, it could really be a, a lot longer before he's done. But uh, I would say that, that uh, there's been a lot of motion on uh, his uh, oldest son, Han Manet, who I know personally, who came to my wedding. It's kind of weird, but you know, we, we've, we were friends for a number of years. And, and so he's been essentially, it looks like anointed as the next person, but there's also rumors that the central committee voted not to proceed. And so it's very strange to me that, that um, uh, Hun Sen's greatest wish, which seems to be to hand power to his oldest son, the one who went to West Point, uh, hasn't yet happened. You know, he could take a lot of pressure out on himself if we were to simply say tomorrow that, you know, I'm, I'm retiring. I want, I want my son to take over because all of the animus that essentially surrounds him would then have to refocus on somebody else because he'd say, you know, and, he, and even if he did a, a, a Lee Kuan Yew with the senior minister maneuver, uh, it seems to me that, that it would be less, it would certainly be more palatable to deal with a younger generation Cambodian uh, politician who isn't from the era from you know the the the, the time of the 1980s onwards uh, and to maybe hand that off I mean it's it seems like a no-brainer I don't understand why it hasn't been done sooner but I guess the pressure needs to build for that to happen so we'll have to see thank you uh, we have another question about Hun Sen which is um, with its current close ties to China, the Hun Sen regime has conducted many secret deals. And do you foresee that the U.S. will abandon its engagement with Cambodia or will it do whatever may be necessary to pressure Hun Sen and China to bring back more democracy to Cambodia? Well, that's, that's really a question that continues to, uh, that's, that, that's, that's something that, one keeps wondering about, right? So the, the pressure has continued and it's continued from what appears to be the, uh, the, the US Department of Defense community. It seems to be that when something happens, uh, National Security Council, uh, DOD uh, leaks some story in the Wall Street Journal, there, that's how we know, for example, that there was an agreement uh, for Riem Naval Base to be somehow shared with the Chinese and this, uh, uh, clause in the agreement of giving the Chinese military personnel Cambodian passports, which for a long time baffled me. It was like, why would you give them Cambodian passports? Well, that turns out that if they're Cambodian passport holders, they wouldn't then be Chinese legally. And so if they're not Chinese legally, then they could be technically allowed under the constitution. Um, but, you know, that pressure doesn't, hasn't seemed to work. So every time they, they, they leak stories about, about what's happening, it's almost like a kind of message to say, like, we know what you're about to do. Don't do it. And then they still do it. They still, you know, demolish the, uh, the, the U.S. built building at Riem. So then they're saying, okay, well, you know, we don't care. We're, 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 dem we're demolishing it. We're proceeding with, with the remodeling of our facility, even though it was built, I think, in 2012. So it's an eight-year-old building, and it was remodeled since then. So it's not not really old. Um, so, you know, somehow it needed to be moved. And that was the argument. It had to be moved 20 miles away or 20 kilometers away or whatnot. And so that was the basis for that rationale. But I think they're spinning their wheels in so far as it's clear that they've tried, they're trying, they're trying to constantly apply that pressure. And the, and the whole global Magnitsky uh, designation of, of UDG, I think, is, is, is an attempt to continue to apply pressure through, through these sanction, uh, uh, targeted sanction instruments to basically tell the Chinese, back off, don't, you know, don't do this with Cambodia or, or you will just, it'll just be a lot of headaches. And of course, nobody wants to be told that. So everybody has to save face and, and keep, keep, keep going. Uh, apropos of uh, your 
last answer. There are several SUA students who have asked if you can give uh, more explanation about global Magnitsky and its effect on international relations with Cambodia. Right, so the first uh, Magnitsky Act was simply targeted at, at, at you know, Russia for what it had done to the lawyer uh, uh, Magnitsky and, and, and in killing him basically while in prison. And then the idea from Senator McCain at the time uh, and others was to, you know, grow this into something that could be more global in nature. And I think as a, as a, as a mechanism, it has a lot of potential because it's not like sanctioning trade and, and making the lives of everyday citizens bad. It's saying person X has been determined to be a specially designated individual or national as SDN and a person X will no longer be able to hold dollars, no longer be able to have banking uh, relationships involving US entities and persons. And so that's really a powerful tool given that the US dollar is, you know, the currency that's used globally. And you know, of course, that's why China is also trying to, you know, start using the RMB as, as an answer to that. So let's, you know, have a way of somehow uh, subverting the power of the dollar. Uh, but uh, the EU is implementing its kind of version of GLOMAG, Global Magnitsky. And hopefully, even with the UK exiting uh, the EU, it w maybe they'll also recognize that there is a, a, an equivalent need from a UK perspective to, to implement uh, Global Magnitsky version uh, for, for itself on, on entities that have been deemed to be, um, you know, corrupt, uh, destroying democracy, uh, land grabbing, whatever, whatever the reasons are, you know, they can use whatever reason. But, but basically, once they're on the list, they're pretty much in big trouble. I see that, that Sovacha Napu has, uh, has, has, has raised his hand. There's also a question that was sent to me uh, privately in which um, uh, Anna No is asking a question. I don't know if I should intervene now and just and just bring it up yeah, just please, in case. Please. Yeah. So Anna, an, an old friend, uh, writes: Robert Mugabe lost his position after China approved a military general coup. Do you think one day China will choose someone else in CPP after Hun Sen lost his popularity or domestic power base? You know, I, I, apparently after the 2012 uh, election. Was it? Yes. The 2012 election, which the CPP nearly lost, probably lost, but didn't officially lose. Uh, then uh, the allegedly the prime minister of Cambodia was was brought in to meet with the Chinese ambassador who basically read him the riot act that, you know, China is not necessarily with you personally. We, we're with whoever will keep our interests uh, in mind. And that makes sense. Right. It's it's Kissinger's. Uh, you know, there are no permanent friends or enemies, only permanent interests, right? So, so the permanent interest of China is to make sure that Chinese interests are uh, top of mind for, for their partners. And so if it happened that, that uh, the CPP were to lose or that Hun Sen had uh, fall, f fell out of favor, then China would have no compunction to find somebody else that could guarantee Chinese interests are kept and protected in Cambodia, and that certainly would would be would be an action. Now, of course, right now, I guess their estimation is not that is isn't that this is going to happen, and so they they feel that continuing with the uh, same horse in this race uh, seems to be what they'd like to do. But it, it's possible. I mean, it's possible that uh, once somebody is uh, has lost favor, maybe it's time to move on. And even within. I think the ruling party, if, if, you know, if the pressure got hot, hot enough, uh, why wouldn't they decide that, you know what, we, we should just change uh, and then that, that would have to happen. Uh, let me give uh, uh, Lok Sovatana a chance to speak. Why don't you go ahead, Lokpu? Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. And Dr. Zabal here and uh, it gave me a pleasure to be connecting with you and after you know we saw each other here in Long Beach about what a year and a half ago. Yeah, pre-COVID. Yeah, pre-COVID. So you're looking well. Uh, once again, my name is Poo Savashana. I uh, 
working, uh, still working at the CICP as a senior research fellow uh, from Cambodia, but now I take a sabbatical leave here to uh, be with my family here. Uh, I want to begin by thanks Dr. Zapal here for giving a, a, a brief snapshot of Cambodia contemporary uh, situation, politi especially political situation. Uh, I, you know, basically from the Cambodian perspective, uh, the government of Cambodia looking at people like myself and Dr. Zapal here, outsider, we are part of the element of uh, confrontation, using confrontation, and we are not welcome to speak the truth, to tell the truth. My question to Dr. Zapal here, uh, you know, we all know the situation together. You and I have been uh, on the floor, many discussion, you know, in front of the public many on R2P and in Cambodia, uh, what, 2015, 2015, right, uh, R2P at 10. So once again, my question to you is how in your capacity as a uh, uh, quite uh, well-known scholar in Cambodia, be able to uh, engage, you know, the local scholar in at home, basically, you know, uh, you, you probably hear the message from Compro lately, you know, with regard to uh, Ratap Han and all those. So, you know, the local scholar in Cambodia would think, would look at you and I or many others, we are also an uh, element of uh, confrontation with the government and they live quite well in uh, Cambodia. So why rock the boat? So what kind of message you will express to them? The other question I have for you, uh, you know, you're looking back at history, Cambodian history, it, it's very clear, you know, uh, uh, the US during the Henry Kissinger and Nixon and uh, William Shawcross, you know, on SciShow really clearly stated that uh, Cambodia served as a SciShow for the US. But right now, Cambodia also serves as a side show for China. Okay, there's no such thing as legal or moral responsibility for superpower. It's a matter of strategic move. So what do you respond to that? Uh, what the interest on China to look at Cambodia as a next strategic move? Also, right. uh, so, sorry, I, uh, one more quick uh, connotation because I haven't seen him for a long time. Uh, connotation, uh, you think that without China, Hun Sen regime st is still in power? And you can see that the free and fair election would happen, you know, in, uh, in 2023 is the coming next election. Thank you for right. allowing me this. Sure, sure. And good to hear from you. And I got to remember all the questions. So let me start from the last one, which is, uh, you know, without China, would, would the ruling party be able to continue? Um, uh, so I, you know, I think that, that, that there's definitely, you know, obviously the resources of China have, have been the, the, the tide that, that has lifted the, the CPP and the, and the prime minister's boat. And so without that, it would be very difficult to see how, how they could continue with the resources that they have, the, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that essentially you know, there's a, there's a um, irrigation project in Cambodia that has been used as a kind of piggy bank. And it, it, it started off apparently at 50 million, then 100 million, then 200 million dollars. And when you go and check out this project, nothing is actually happening. There's a trench and there's a little motor and every few kilometers that wouldn't cost more than a, a few, uh, a couple of hundred dollars. So there's no way hundreds of millions of dollars were spent on this. But of course, it's a mechanism for distributing money to the ruling party during elections, and it's all courtesy of China. So, uh, so definitely, I, I would say, you know, where's the money come from? It's, it's that golden rule. It's, 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 it's the supply of resources from there. You're, you, so I, I, I do think that without China, things would be completely uh, different. That's why, in a way, having, having China is, is why we're, we're getting what we're getting. Even if it's not causation, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's just, it, it's ancillary in its, in its relationship. Um, the second question you had was sideshow China, sideshow Cambodia, right? So 
so yeah, I mean, uh, Cambodia appears to be a useful foil for, for what happens uh, with China. So when they're not happy with, with uh, something uh, the United States has done, maybe they can use Cambodia to make a point. Maybe Cambodia can go out front and say, you know, oh yes, we, 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 we you know, um, we're going to go meet with Xi Jinping because COVID-19 is, you know, this is not the time to abandon your friends. You should, you should be with your friends, et cetera. So the prime minister had even said that Cambodian foreign students in, in Wuhan should, should, should stay there. They should struggle together and, uh, and not, not, the, not abandon their, their hosts. Um, so, you know, these are, these are all messages. I don't know whether he was told to say that, but it seems to be like, if you think about what would be nice for China to hear, that's what he's going to say. Um, and as a sideshow, yeah, I mean, Cambodia has, used, has, uh, has been used in, in that capacity by the United States, by China. And, uh, and so I, I, would, I, would, I would agree that there's, there's definitely that element of, of, uh, of we're, we're just part of something or another. And it's, it's, it's clearly not the main course. Um, on the scholars front, I agree that uh, there is that, although I would disagree on one thing. I'm not sure that in CAMPRO, you necessarily have, the people who are writing are necessarily scholars. What they are appears to me to be political hacks who are clearly you know, sons of the Supreme Court justice, who is himself a secretary of state somewhere. And, and it's just clear that he's there as a political actor. He's there to, to, to prop up the regime. So. Uh, what he says isn't scholarly, it's, it's just political. And, and yeah, there are people who also on the side write on you know, uh, various uh, news sites and so on, but they've simply been, uh, been able to insert themselves into the dialogue, even though they're not, they're not actually scholars. They're probably, I think that guy's a computer scientist, but he, he's, he's just, it's clear that he's a political hack. There's a, there's a picture of him with the, with being initiated into the ruling party. So he, his job is to do this on CAMPRO. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I think there are real scholars. We have some of them here on, on this call, uh, like, uh, like Kim Kong Hang, who is publishing tons and tons of stuff. He's uh, getting his PhD in Australia. And I think it's, it's wonderful. They're doing fine work that needs to be highlighted and needs to be uh, you know, uh, 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 talked about. Uh, and so I don't, I don't think that Camp Pro should be the basis of much. I know Rata, she's an old friend. I feel for her, she's getting attacked on, on there, but it's kind of inside baseball in that sense. Um, so, so yes, um, uh, let's, 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 uh, let's take more questions. I think there may be students' questions that I wanna try to answer as well, since I am being hosted by uh, Soka University of America, and I wanna make sure that all students' questions are answered because Shane told me he has a question. I see it here, but I want to make sure that, uh, to, to get all the students' questions before everybody leaves uh, the, this, this session here because we're, we're at 51 currently uh, participants. Uh, let me give you a question I received from a student. Uh, given that China resists engagement with civil society in serious ways when it comes to its development projects, what else can European countries do to address the question of democratic backsliding and the negative impacts of investments financed by the PRC? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, that's really a, a, a basic thing that is at the core of the challenge, right? So when projects don't involve um, any kind of impact assessments that, that would allow some kind of dialogue between civil society and and the people behind that project that's really that's really all it and china of course sees the government as the representative of the people whether true or not i mean it's just saying hey the government said it was what they wanted and they're the representatives of the people so it, it, in a weird twisted kind of logic you can kind of see that 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 it kind of makes sense if that's how you feel but it doesn't add up to uh the fact that people have been, have had their land taken away from them. So when I hear things like, um, so I, I had as, as a professor um, at Berkeley when I was a grad student there, I had um, uh, James Robinson uh, who co-authored um, Why Nations Fail. 
And he, he told me the story of when he went to Cambodia and asked a, a Cambodian farmer, what is development? And the farmer said, development is uh, they build a road and, and, and take away my land. And that is uh, really, I think at its core, what we're now facing when we think about the infrastructure projects, the dams that are going to flood valleys and, and create uh, you know, all this displacement of people the destruction of nature and, and the things that, that, that make Cambodia special as a place, right? If you take away, um, you know, the forests and, and, and nature in Cambodia, what else are you left with? You're left with Angkor Wat. And, and it's, of course, these, you know, when it pre COVID-19 was overrun by Chinese tourists. So, so it's, 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 it's difficult. It's difficult. Um, and on top of that, you have the fact that there are Chinese investors who are coming into Cambodia and who see Cambodians as, you know, just uh, literally, it was it was in a in a, a Human Rights Watch Asia report uh, quoted as, "Hey, they're lucky to have us here. Otherwise, they'd be eating mangoes off of trees." And so uh, that is that is the embodiment, I think, of the ugly American turned into this uh, instead ugly Chinese, which isn't, I'm sure, what uh, what China wants to project as an image. It shouldn't be that, hey, you should, you should be so grateful that we're here to just give you a few, a few, uh, a few coins and, and, and you should be so happy that this is happening. It ought to be more of a partnership. And I'm, I don't know how, uh, what would motivate China and its business interests to, to, to further examine uh, this. But the, the style, of course, of doing business is, is much more of a, you know, I paid my bribe you're supposed to be my partner and you're supposed to take care of all these problems. These problems, of, that is, all these people that are complaining, they, they need to be controlled and removed from the scene. And that's unfortunate. Uh, I have another question from an SUA student. Uh, how do the large numbers of ethnically Chinese-owned businesses in other Asian countries factor into international relations within Southeast Asia? Right. So, you know, I, th I think what it is, is um, uh, it, Chinese owned businesses have, have been uh, a reality in much of Southeast Asia. There's, you know, in Indonesia and in Malaysia, there, there's, there's all these uh, boomy sort of pro boomy programs that are supposed to essentially be the kind of affirmative action for, you know, hey, the natives, the people who actually are the people from that country, right? So the Malays and, and, and less, you know, uh, giving advantage to, to, the China, to ethnic Chinese. And that's, that's sort of been that answer from their perspective in, uh, in Singapore. Of course, it's the Ch ethnic Chinese that, that dominate Singapore already in the Singapore government. So I, I don't think you're going to see a situation where somehow the ethnic Chinese would say, no, 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 we're, we're gonna allow the Indians to, to control to, uh, the ethnic Indians or the ethnic Malays to control Singapore. Uh, but it's still a multicultural society. And I think the key there is, is that they've been able to avoid a lot of that um, uh, tension, a lot of the problems, because they've more or less kind of created a balance uh, where, you know, everybody will, will be part of that society. Uh, no, that they won't be in control. It'll still be the ethnic Chinese but it'll still be, it'll be sort of a balance and, and, the, and they've weighed that and it, it seems to have worked. Although there is xenophobia now where they uh, in Singapore are, are getting very unhappy with uh, foreign expatriate workers who are uh, say Indians, for example, coming into work in white collar jobs and so on, which they feel, you know, Singaporeans should have these jobs. Um, but but the yeah the, the ethnic uh, the, the the reality of ethnic Chinese controlled businesses is is one that precedes the rise of China or the return of China to its rightful sort of size in the global economy. It's it's something that has happened over time because of the diaspora that that ethnic Chinese have have moved all across Southeast Asia and are frankly ensconced in in business activities and and therefore at a great advantage. You know the rice market is is very thin, for example, and it's Apparently, a bunch of the two uh, gentlemen, old men, sitting around a table that set the price of rice in, in Bangkok. Uh, it is not anybody else that sets the price of rice. It is these gentlemen that, that set that price, and, and that's just the reality of it. Thank you. I, I think you mentioned that Shane Barter, SUA faculty member, had a question. 
Yes, he did. He said, um, to what extent do you think that China is seeking to use Cambodia as a way to manipulate ASEAN? Kind of as a mole, as one Philippine diplomat put it. Um, it's been well known. I think the reality is that uh, in the 2012 uh, ASEAN um, ministers meeting and, and um, uh, subsequent to that, when Cambodia chaired ASEAN, that was the opportunity for uh, Cambodia to really flex its muscle as, as, as chair of ASEAN that year. And that was the year that, um, the, uh, that ASEAN was not able to come up with a, uh, a joint resolution at the end of its meeting. So it could not mention, for example, the South China Sea or code of conduct and any of the things that Vietnam and the Philippines wanted to have mentioned um, and so it kind of hijacked the whole thing. And ASEAN works, of course, as a, as a consensus-driven organization. So, uh, you know, one member says no, it doesn't pass. And so that's really the weakness of ASEAN in that um, you, cannot, you cannot run the thing with, without, with, with just majority or even supermajority. You have to have complete consensus. And when you don't have consensus, then the default, of course, is, is nothing happens. That's why... Hun Sen, for example, was saying he's going to cause, you know, the uh, Australia ASEAN special summit to, to fail because if he doesn't go, uh, nothing can be signed because he's an ASEAN member and he is ASEAN, the embodiment of ASEAN and so on. So, so that's, that's, that's the sad reality of ASEAN's sort of Achilles heel that has now been manipulated to the point where, um, and of course, China is smart enough not to just have Cambodia. So they've also been courting Laos, and so Laos is, is also sort of uh, siding with Cambodia. And so the, these are countries that are not claimants to the South China Sea dispute with, with China. They're, they're countries that, that don't have anything to do with the South China Sea in terms of claiming anything. And so they're, they're then able to neutralize all the claimant countries. Uh, there is also one question that I'm seeing that was sent to me by Savun Nim. Um, who writes, it is very depressing to hear and know all these facts, but if you were to give some hopeful message for Cambodian youth students domestically, internationally, for the possibility of change and prosperity, and, the, and, and, and what would those messages be? I would request to say, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I did, you should say that at the beginning and said I, I gave the name. Okay, all right, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, the, the, the hopeful message, I think, is still one of, look, um, the reality is that everything changes over time, right? That you cannot simply uh, remain the same. After all, the Buddha said, you know, you can't escape disease, you can't escape death, you know, you can't escape old age. And so the reality is at some point, what is now our present will, will not be our present. And, and I'm not saying, okay, let's wait a hundred years. <laughs> I'm saying that the young people who are in Cambodia, the, the youth, the students, et cetera, they've shown more courage, I would say, than, than, than many of the old guard politicians who, who are still debating whether to return to Cambodia or you know, who are making cutting deals with Hun Sen possibly, doing things that obviously are unfortunate because um, w w the, I think they're stuck in, in the reality uh, uh, that they see as you know, these, these are, these are just, uh, you know, there are only a few options. And I think it's, it's um, uh, somebody once said that, you know, to the beginner, there are many possibilities, but to the expert, there are only a few possibilities. And so for young people, they're, they're like the beginners who see many possibilities. And that's exactly what we need. We need that fresh thinking that allows for more possibilities for, for change and, and uh, acceptance of, I think, uh, of, 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 of a different future for Cambodia, as opposed to, you know, many of the politicians who frankly are stuck with, you know, old thinking and old ways and old animosities, which of course linger from, from, uh, from their years of battling it out together. So um, the answer is that Cambodian youth and students themselves are, are that hope for change. They, they represent that future. All right. Do we JP. have time for one more student question? Ab absolutely. Absolutely. I'm more than happy. My goodness. Um, 
what would be your recommended strategy for the United States in its engagement with Cambodia? Well, I have been an advocate for um, continued pressure using global Magnitsky human rights accountability instruments. Uh, I actually think that, that um, for a long time, it was minimally used. Uh, there, was, there wasn't anybody named. And then suddenly, okay, one person, the bodyguard of the prime minister, who was a general, was named. And then, then a few more were named. And, you know, it's, it's building up. So, you know, I think, I think using that as a basis for, um, for making, um, uh, for, for, for essentially targeting individuals, companies, et cetera, that are bad actors is, I think, one way of doing it. But I mean, overall, the message has to be clear, right? It's, it's, it's a kind of, you know, the diplomats are always wanting to have good relationships with the countries they operate in. And sometimes that leads to incredibly strange bedfellows and choices that, that are just repugnant. I mean, it's, it's, the reality is that, that, you know, I feel as though the, the, the diplomats should be standing up more firmly for uh, the actions of the U.S. Treasury Department in so far as saying, okay, well, you know, we, we, we have a list here. We have 12 generals that need to be added to uh, GLOMAG, and they, they, should be, they should be added uh, quickly. Um, there are other instruments as well that, you know, of U.S. power. Obviously, you know, one of the biggest destinations of exports from Cambodia is to the United States. Now, if you start tackling that, and, and Cambodia has been bragging about you know, the expansion of trade with the United States, that would represent much more money than, than U.S. foreign aid to Cambodia, which is like 50, 60 million dollars, right? It's, it's, a, it's a joke compared to the billions involved in trade. Now, of course, the, um, the side effect of touching that kind of money is that, you know, people with livelihoods on the line, they're the ones working and making those products. Now, of course, a lot of them are making products that uh, in sweatshop conditions, uh, be getting paid very little. And so, you know, and with COVID-19, I'm not sure that that's going to continue uh, very far in terms of expanding trade. But, but, uh, but, you know, the EU has kind of taken that, that, that approach. It said, you know, 20% trade sanctions in terms of EBA, uh, everything but arms. And I think that's, that's really, um, I, I certainly felt that it was uh, a, a, you know, a move that, that was valid. Uh, I know there are people who kept arguing that no, 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 any kind of, any kind of, uh, you know, action against, you know, trade is a bad action and so on. But how can you have an, an instrument of trade preferences like EBA that is based on human rights, that is based on democracy, and then say, no, no, it's okay. We, we don't care about what you're doing. And, that, and of course, Cambodia is going to argue you know, why us and not Vietnam that's more, that's communist and like treats its people horribly? Why, why not, you know, some other countries that are doing a horrible thing to its people? Well, I'm sorry, it's not always consistent. Uh, that should be the message. It's ne nobody ever said Uncle Sam was consistent, but at least in the case of Cambodia, the EU saw that, um, that doing EBA, cutting EBA by 20% was the appropriate action. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I think Brussels sent a message now, whether it's heard by Phnom Penh, whether the reaction is, oh yes, now we're gonna give back human rights and you know, build up democracy and, 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 and increase freedom. Doesn't appear to be the case. Does it mean you know, we should just stop this? I don't know. I just, I just think that it hasn't been long enough for it to have maybe that in, intended consequence. There's one little question from a former student of mine, if I may, dear Professor, can you comment a bit on the China-led new institutions such as AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? Um, is China providing efficient alternatives to the, uh, to the uh, existing Japan-led, U.S. regional-led uh, institutions and by which uh, Maya is referring to the um, Asian Development Bank? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think that First of all, um, to its credit, the AIIB does not have a board that is located on site, which is really a scam, frankly. Uh, ADB has this executive board that is a sinecure for uh, 
political hacks who apparently need to be rewarded and sent off to Manila for a nice life for a few years. Um, so that's one huge expense that it doesn't have to suffer. Uh, whether it has adequate um, uh, safeguards and mechanisms remains to be seen. I know that there's certainly a hope that, that AIB will operate like uh, other regional banks and uh, international financial institutions insofar as it would have you know, safeguards, environmental impact assessments, and so on. So I think they're talking about those things. Of course, they're still very new. It's hard to, um, to determine whether that'll be the case going forward. But, but, um, but, but you know, it's, it represents an alternative and competition, which, if you believe in the free market, means that the ADB will have to step up its game and, and, and behave in a way that is more competitive as opposed to monopolistic, which is bad for the consumers. Uh, of course, for regimes that maybe believe in authoritarianism, this is great for them too, because they'll say, hey, if you don't give it to us, we'll go to the AIIB. And so, you know, we'll never, we'll never be without um, uh, the resources we need or want for uh, continuing our, uh, you know, our, our economic uh, transformation. Um, so, so that's, that's probably an inadequate answer, Maya, but I'm so glad that, uh, are you, uh, that I, I, as far as I remember, you're in Georgetown these days, so you're calling in from, a, from the East Coast. So thank you for staying on. Uh, JP, I'm happy to continue answering. I can't believe there's still 45 folks on this, on this call. I, I, it, it would, it would, I would be remiss in saying it's over, but I wanna be mindful of anybody who has to go, of anybody who can't stay. I'm happy to continue answering. I have host capability anyway, so I could, I could, I could cut it off whenever I need to, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just really glad that we're having this conversation and that, we're, um, that, that everyone is, is here, really. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I throw a uh, somewhat philosophical question at you. Absolutely, um, why not? Um, <laughs> when uh, I was in graduate school in the early 90s, there was lots of talk about Fukuyama. We have arrived at the end of history. Uh, this is the inevitable path to the future that we will all end up in a state of uh, liberal democracy. Looking back on that now, because there are, of course, many people who have not only criticized his ideas, but attempted to reinterpret what he has said and transform it into ways that some are, are sometimes far beyond what I think he intended. From your perspective now in the year 2020, what do you think about Fukuyama's idea that inevitably democracy is the end of history? And what does your experience researching, studying, writing about Southeast Asia have to illustrate about this? Well, you know, it's interesting because I have that slide in, in the presentation in which I quote him. But then I also say, I also quote him saying that, you know, there could be temporary setbacks it, 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 to, to this. So he didn't simply say, okay, we've reached the end of history and, and ta-da, we have democracy and, and, and markets and this is where we're going to be um, forever and ever. So he allowed for the possibility that his Hegelian synthesis would, would not end necessarily at that point, but would maybe take longer and longer and longer. And of course, it's like any hypothesis. Uh, if, you can't, uh, uh, if you can't disprove it, then, you know, uh, it, it's not really valid at that point, right? So, so I would say that the argument would be that, um, yeah, I mean, obviously he made, he made some assertions that, that were very dramatic at the time and, uh, and he's paid the price in, I think, countless sort of ridicule from the standpoint of, well, you know, it isn't the end of history now, is it? Because we, we keep going. And I think if anything, the, the message from, from earlier, uh, when I was answering a, a question about you know uh, young people and the hope uh, uh, for the future for them, is 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 simply that you know con history will continue and we and you know people will stop being leaders because they will frankly die and so you know somebody else will take over and and there'll be a chance but of course this could happen at any time so it it doesn't have to mean that you, you should be hopeless about this and 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 fighting for change. I think is the responsibility of everyone who believes uh, in in change and in and in seeing a society improve. Right. So you know, people who are bystanders are actually accepting the the status quo, and 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 in some ways they're really behaving as though they're enabling the status quo when they're not 
standing up to it. So, so um, I think I went all over the place on that, but I will, I will simply say that Francis Fukuyama uh, had, had, you know, got caught on that and um, he kept enough of a, of a uh, possible counter argument or uh, delay in his argument that, that would say, okay, well, maybe, maybe it hasn't happened yet and we're still working towards that. Thank you. That was, uh, you untangled what was originally my very tangled question. I appreciated it. <laughs> no and worries. One final question from an SUA student. Um, what do you see as the prospects for peace, the development or continuation of peace in Southeast Asia, an area that has so many conf uh, conflicting influences and the danger of the outbreak of war? Yeah, no, I, I well, look, I, I mean, uh, Southeast Asia remains an area where even though ASEAN members are meeting three times a day sometimes, um, which is, I think, uh, a valid criticism of ASEAN, you know, the endless talk shop of thousands of meetings per year. Um, it's still a place where Cambodia and Thailand uh, were fighting over Prevahia, the land under Prevahia, and who actually owned it, and who was actually uh, supposed to have been given that land by the International Court of Justice at The Hague. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a place where where, where neighbors can still have disputes and uh, hopefully those disputes can be untangled without casualties, without anybody dying. But, but um, uh, the reality is, you know, people are still uh, living in Southeast Asia, very much so in the mode of Westphalia. It is, these are nation states, um, you know, it, it, it's still Thailand first for the Thais and it'll still be Cambodia first for the Cambodians, although, Increasingly in a kind of triangulated China with Cambodia uh, marriage, but um, but I think that for Cambodians who um, who don't appreciate the uh, a level of intervention by China in Cambodia or the uh, maybe the, the the power that China sw uh, holds sway over Cambodia that that they'll be they'll be saying you know we've we've had enough now of course China is not bordering Cambodia so that there, there's a difference between countries that share borders and countries that don't share borders and actually. Uh, Prince Sihanouk was was very um, cognizant of this. He said that you know we're you know with Vietnam we we just can't allow Vietnam to be to be too friendly with us because they share a border with us. But with China they don't share a border with us. Of course this was still under the view of like you have to cross borders in order to get into this country. So maybe you know nowadays with planes with ships and so on you don't even have to do that. You can just send your troops via air into a country. Uh, but it's, it speaks to the idea that countries that share borders really have a little bit more sensitivities to navigate. Um, it's, just, it's just that much more dangerous to engage in uh, too perhaps deep a relationship because, uh, because then it could, it, could, it could lead to invasion. Um, it's an old way, old school way of thinking about, about conflict, but I think it's, it's still valuable. And, uh, and you see that, you know, Malaysia and Singapore occasionally still having little, little scuffles about this or that. Maybe it's about water, maybe it's about pride, national pride. But, you know, at the beginning of Singapore's uh, independence, there was no certainty at all that it wouldn't be simply absorbed by another country, right? Malaysia, whatnot. And so it was, it was tough for, for a little place like that to, to make its way in the world. And it did. Um, no, thank you very much uh, for all of your detailed answers and your presentation. And on behalf of the PBRC and Soka University, we would like to thank you uh, as our, not only our guest, but thank you. Uh, someone who always has interesting things to add to the conversation. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, really. It's been a huge honor. and. Um, you know, and, and to meet so many friends uh, out here on this occasion uh, is, is particularly exciting. And we didn't have any, any Zoom bombing happen, so I'm really happy about that. Uh, so that is a victory in itself. So anyhow, I'm, I'm, happy, to, I'm happy to remain or whatever to loiter. If, if you want to go, that's fine. Uh, I, I know that there are some folks that, that probably wanted to say hello very briefly or whatnot, but it's up to you, JP. 
Oh, I, I'm a, uh, when it comes to interesting discussions, I'm a professional loiterer, so I'm fine. Um, but uh, again, let us thank uh, Professor Ear for his presentation, and uh, we hope to see many of you here back again for our Distinguished Speaker Series soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, if, uh, if, if anybody wants to unmute and say hi, uh, we can shoot the breeze. I know that, that uh, <laughs> people are all leaving. It's fine. But, uh, you know, if, if you want to hang around, I'm happy to chat. That we don't get many occasions. And the time works for Cambodia 